you want to know the truth, I'm a lazy kind of guy. If I'm going from point A to point B, I'm going to find the quickest, easiest way to do that. And at Thanksgiving time, point A is raw turkey and point B is cooked turkey with perfectly juicy meat and crispy skin. With the thousands of turkey recipes that come out every year, you might not think that there's one best way to cook a turkey, but you'd be wrong. There is a best way and it's called spatchcocking. Here's how it works. Now, we all know the problem with trying to roast a whole turkey, right? It lies in the fact that the leg meat has a lot of connective tissue and fat, and it needs to be cooked up to around 165 degrees. Meanwhile, the lean breast meat will dry out if it gets much hotter than about 150 degrees or so. Now here's what happens when you put a turkey into a standard roasting pan. You see the problem? The breasts are fully exposed. Meanwhile, the legs are shielded by the side of the pan, which makes them cook slower. It's almost as if somebody designed a device specifically to make the breasts dry out before the legs are done cooking. So the question is, how can you get your turkey to cook more evenly, cook faster, and taste better all in one go? Just flatten it out. By spatchcocking a turkey, you give yourself four major advantages over a standard roasted bird. First, a flatter shape means more even cooking. By flattening out your turkey and spreading its legs, those thighs and drumsticks, which were once the most protected part of the bird, are now the most exposed. And because they're thinner and lie flatter than the breast, they cook faster too. This is important because it means that your breasts and your legs will come up to their ideal final temperatures at the same time. Advantage number two, check this out. All of the skin is on top. Now with a traditional turkey, it's really easy to get crisp skin on the top of the bird, but the sides and the bottom end up a little bit soggy. On the other hand, with a flattened bird, all of the skin is evenly exposed to the heat of the oven. And not only that, but there are plenty of escape routes for rendering fat and drippings. This guarantees that you're gonna end up with crisper skin in the end. Your next advantage, a thinner profile that makes for faster cooking. Now, a normal turkey takes a few hours to cook, and this is because it's basically spherical in shape, which limits the maximum temperature at which you can cook it. If you try and increase your oven temperature too much, you end up burning the outside before the middle gets hot. A spashcock turkey, on the other hand, lies flat. This means that you can blast it in an oven as hot as 450 degrees, which makes it cook in about half the time that you'd need for a traditional turkey. Finally, spatchcocking provides you with a turkey back, which allows you to naturally enhance the flavor of your gravy. Of course, the only downside to the whole thing is that you're not gonna be able to present the plump, round, Norman Rockwell vision of a perfect Thanksgiving turkey, but who really cares when it tastes so good? And if anyone complains, here's a little trick. Just take a drumstick and shove it in their mouth. I promise you it'll shut them up. You convinced yet? Good, now here's how you do it. The easiest way to spatchcock a turkey is to ask your butcher to do it for you. But if that doesn't fly, it's almost as easy to do it yourself at home. All you need is a turkey, some poultry shears, and a paring knife. Pat the turkey dry with paper towels and then place it breast side down on the cutting board to prep it for surgery. Holding the bird firmly, make a cut down one side of the backbone. You might need to put in a little bit of effort to get through the leg bones or the rib bones, but don't worry, Mr. Turkey here won't feel a thing. Repeat with the second side and your backbone should pop right out. At this point, you also want to trim off any excess fat. Next, use your paring knife to cut around the wishbone, running it along both sides of each bone. You should be able to pop it right out. This isn't 100% necessary, but it'll make it easier to carve down the line. Next, flip the bird over and spread its legs out. Then press down on its breastbone hard to flatten it. You should feel the breastbone crack a little bit. Now tuck the wingtips underneath and you're all set to roast. Line a rim baking sheet with aluminum foil and scatter some diced vegetables on top of it. Onions, carrots, and celery, along with some sprigs of thyme and a couple of bay leaves. These vegetables not only add flavor to the drippings, but they also release enough moisture to prevent your drippings from scorching. Set a wire rack on top of the vegetables and then arrange your turkey on top of it and season it well with salt and pepper. Then throw it all into a 450 degree oven and set your timer. While the turkey roasts, chop up the backbone with a cleaver or a chef's knife then saute it in some oil in a saucepan until it gets a little bit brown. Add some more aromatic vegetables and saute those too. Finally, cover it all up with some homemade or store-bought chicken broth, add some aromatics, and let it simmer for about 45 minutes before straining. To thicken your gravy, cook a quarter cup of flour with a few tablespoons of butter until it's golden, and then very slowly whisk in your stock to make a rich, thick gravy. I like to add a touch of soy sauce and fish sauce along with plenty of black pepper in order to boost its rich, savory flavor. When your turkey is approaching the 75 minute mark, start checking its temperature. I like my breast meat at around 145 to 150 degrees, 
which is technically lower than the government recommends you do it, but the extra juicy meat is well worth the minimal risks for me. When it hits temperature, take the tray out of the oven, whisk the drippings into your gravy, and wait about 20 minutes for the turkey to rest before carving and serving. To carve a splashcock turkey, start by cutting off the first leg by slicing through the joint where the thigh meets the body. Next, find the joint between the thigh and the drumsticks by rotating the drumstick back and forth, and then cut through that joint with your knife. Repeat everything with the other leg. Remove the wings by locating the ball joint near the top of the breast and working the knife through it. The wings can be left whole or further separated into drumettes and flats by cutting through the first joint. Hold the breast firmly in place with one hand and then slice down one side of the breast using the tip of the knife to follow the contour of the bone. Continue using the tip of the knife to slowly work the meat away from the breastbone, pulling it outwards with your fingertips to separate the meat from the bone. As you continue to slice, the breast should fall away in one complete piece. Make sure you take the tenderloin along with it. Repeat this for the other side, and you now have two breast halves, two drumsticks, two thighs, four wing pieces, and one carcass which you can use to pick meat from for leftover soup. To continue carving the turkey into serving pieces, slice each breast into several slices on a bias and transfer to a warm serving platter. The hip bone should still be attached to the back of the thighs and this has to be removed. To do this, pick up the flat bone from one side and gently shake it back and forth until the thigh bone pops out of its socket. Pry away the hip bone and save it along with the carcass for soup. Now cut along one side of the thigh bone with the tip of your knife, removing as much meat as possible along the side. Repeat this on the other side of the bone, and then save those bones along with the rest of the bones. Slice the dark meat across its width into thin serving portions and add it to the warm platter. Then top it all with the wing pieces and the drumsticks. Who really needs a large centerpiece when you've got a platter full of perfectly cooked meat and crisp skin to pass around? I promise you, your guests will not miss it. <laughs>